a biblical mandate for God's chosen people. And, almost as important to Truman, it embodied the seeds of democracy and freedom in the Middle East, a significant region both in the Cold War and in world history. So first, let's turn to Truman, faith, and religion. Political scientists and historians have generally ignored Harry Truman's faith and its influence on his politics, or they have characterized his religion as crude and simplistic. Yet religion was important to Truman and his worldview. Upon inspection, what emerges is a, deep, a man of deep, if simple, faith who depended only a little on formal religion, but prayed daily. And Truman did not change when he became president. He carried his faith into his statecraft, arguing that an ethical code was necessary to politics properly understood. Truman chose the Baptist religion in part because he was comfortable with the democratic bearing of Baptists. Yet Truman did not select his religion because of his politics. In fact, his politics seemed to have derived from his faith, perhaps more than from his parents. He joined the Baptist church at the age of eight, 18 and was baptized shortly thereafter. Although his family background was mostly Baptist, he chose that denomination deliberately after exposure to Presbyterian Sunday School as a child, interaction with members of the main Christian and Mormon churches, and many, many readings of the Bible. He believed that his Baptist sect gave, quote, the common man the shortest and most direct approach to God, end quote. Around the same time, his interest in politics was really just emerging, even though his father was a partisan Democrat. To Truman, all believers of every revealed religion could agree on the meaning as well as the value of the biblical precepts of the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. In his later years, he recounted what his grandfather had told him, that all Christians wanted to arrive at the same place, but they had to fight about it to see who had the inside track with the Almighty. His grandfather concluded that none of them had any special in with God, because he would make his own decision about who had been good or bad on this planet. Truman adopted this opinion. Shortly after becoming president, he wrote in his longhand notes, quote, a lot of the world's troubles have been caused by the interpretation of the Gospels, and the controversies between sects and creeds. It is also silly and comes of the prima donna complex again." End quote. God, he wrote, never played favorites. So with that, now let's turn to faith, freedom, and the Cold War. In order to fight the Cold War, President Truman oversaw a revolution in American foreign policy. Characterized by policies and institutions such as the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, NATO, and the Berlin Airlift, the strategy of containment redefined liberal internationalism and involved the United States in the world as never before. Despite such programs, however, the communists made gains in atomic weapons, propaganda, Europe, and China in the late 1940s. Truman believed in the end the Cold War would be won or lost on moral grounds, and Korea confirmed that even more for him. He could not turn to the United Nations, he thought, for moral authority, since the Soviets had subverted the international organization's original intent. Instead, the president endeavored to take the moral high ground in the East-West conflict by developing a two-pronged political strategy involving the mass media and the world's major religions that also coupled the governmental and private sectors. In April 1950, Truman launched what he called the Campaign of Truth, the expansion of Voice of America and creation of Radio Free Europe and soon Radio Liberty were all part of the campaign. Then Truman aimed to harness and coordinate the world's religions in an effort to stop the communists and what he viewed as their elemental godlessness. The Catholic Church was central to Truman's efforts and this component of containment met with mixed results. In May 1946, Truman reappointed Myron Taylor as his personal representative to Pope Pius XII, this time, though, with the added rank of ambassador, marking the Vatican's first full diplomatic recognition by the United States. Numerous objections, especially from Protestants, led the president to retract the proposal. Nevertheless, Truman sent Taylor on special missions to the pontiff, for the next several years, and in 1947 involved him in embarking on a global endeavor to fight communism 
and extend world peace. After Taylor retired due to health reasons, Truman then nominated General Mark Clark as ambassador in October 1951. The president's nomination met with fierce objections from Protestants generally and from U.S. senators, especially Southern Democrats who were unimpressed by Clark's World War II record. Substantial amounts of White House mail at one point ran six and a half to one against sending an ambassador to the Vatican. Although Truman remained committed to the nomination, Clark asked to have his name withdrawn from consideration in January 1952. With no support and no nominee, the president reluct reluctantly abandoned recognition of the Vatican and effectively the religious campaign of truth. It frustrated Truman that some of the world's main religions rejected his reasoning that faith was the most powerful weapon in the Cold War. And he was irked that Protestant denominations would not grant the Catholic Church a unique religious and political role in combating communism. Shortly after Clark's, uh, Clark's withdrawal as nominee, the president described privately his conversation with the head bishop of the Episcopal Church, who was objecting to formal and full U.S. Holy See relations. Truman replied that his concern was not protocol, but, quote, to organize the moral forces against the immoral forces. I told him that Stalin and his crowd had no intellectual honesty and no moral code, that they had broken 30 or 40 treaties they'd made with us in the free world, and that all I wanted to do was organize Exodus 20, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, to save morals in the world. What a travesty, wrote Truman. If a Baptist can see what's toward, why not a high-hat Church of England bishop? In the president's containment strategy, the Catholic Church was always the fulcrum of a global religious movement for faith and freedom against communism, but it was also always the main impediment in Protestant eyes. And now we turn to faith, freedom, and Palestine. During his presidency, Truman also developed a special relationship with the Jewish people. In this regard, a homeland for the Jews, who made up 20% of the displaced persons from World War II, was vital to Truman. Much has been speculated about his motivations for promoting a Jewish homeland and recognizing the new state of Israel. To be sure, the president aimed to prevent a Kremlin foothold in the region, as evidenced by the Truman Doctrine. And it was hoped that the new Jewish state would introduce democracy to the Middle East. But Truman had long been sympathetic to the plight of the Jewish people. His study of history and the Bible informed his opinions of the Jews and the region of the Middle East while his lifelong friendship with businessman Eddie Jacobson and his working relationships with advisors such as Max Lowenthal and David Niles during his senatorial and presidential years reinforced his religious tolerance. As president, Truman endorsed the Balfour Declaration of 1917 in which the British had promised support to the Jews for a national homeland in Palestine. Building on this foundation, Truman first backed partition of Palestine and then in May 1948, had the United States confer de facto recognition upon the state of Israel within minutes of its declaration of independence. After Israel's first elections in late January 1949 to establish its government, the United States extended de jure recognition. Before, during, and after these developments, Truman advocated a home as well as general liberalized international immigration for the Jews and did so in the face of significant opposition from the Arab world and from most of the State Department, the Secretary of Defense, and other top advisors in his administration. Although the Holocaust had caused the displacement as well as deaths of millions of Jews, Truman identified a legitimate Jewish right to Palestine that preceded the horrors of the Second World War or the Balfour Decora Declaration. He would cite, among other biblical passages, from Deuteronomy as his evidence. Behold, I have given up the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land which the Lord hath sworn unto your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Truman believed that historical, moral, and religious rights met in their defense of a Jewish homeland. Now finally we turn to faith, freedom, and peace. Truman always wanted to be remembered as a man of peace, especially in his efforts as President of the United States. Peace remained his deepest wish and preeminent political goal. Harboring few illusions, however, about the city of man, he put his trust and hope for peace in the Bible. Consistently, he argued that if man read or heard and lived by the truths of Exodus, the prophets, 
and the Gospel of Matthew, the people of the world would be at peace and truly free. Further, only in the context of freedom, Truman believed, could man exercise the free will necessary to the formation of peace and happiness. As he concluded in his 1949 inaugural address, quote, but I say to all men, what we have achieved in liberty, we will surpass in greater liberty. Steadfast in our faith in the Almighty, we will advance toward a world where man's freedom is secure. To, the, to that end, we will devote our strength, our resources, and our firmness of resolve. With God's help, the future of mankind will be assured in a world of justice, harmony, and peace. The Cold War modified and further moderated Truman's outlook about the possibilities of global peace. On the one hand, he rejected the idealism of those who ignored reality. He may have preferred plowshares, but he knew that now was a time to turn those plowshares into swords and not the other way around. Truman also rejected, on the other hand, that narrow realism which failed to recognize the moral challenge of communism. The Cold War, for all its complications and confusions, was for Truman what he called a battle between the world of morals and the world of no morals. And only the combined strength of the West, military, political, economic, and moral, could defeat the immorality of communism and bring international peace. In the end, this conflict made the peace he envisioned all the more distant and perhaps unattainable. It also made Truman think hard about what could be achieved and what had to be done to achieve it. Freedom, justice, and order emerged in his writings and speeches as the principles that created the circumstances under which a real and durable peace might be possible. And of those principles, Truman reasoned that freedom had to take root first and had to be defended first. Peace was the fruit of liberty, he concluded, not its precondition. The lesson of peace that it is sometimes necessary to learn and make war was difficult for Truman and a generation of Americans who had fought one war to make the world safe for democracy and another recently to rid it of Nazism. They had hoped and many had believed that the Second World War had accomplished what the First World War had failed to achieve. Instead, they found themselves in a different kind of war which was even more terrifying and more threatening to liberal democracy and the cause of free government. In this circumstance, Harry Truman reminded his time of the centrality and universality of human freedom, and like the prophet Joel, that peace requires not only freedom, but also the strength and willpower to defend it. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And now we have a presentation by Professor Jack Hall, and this is Dwight D. Eisenhower, exegetical president. Jack? Ah, and we have a high-tech presentation besides. Oh, okay. Okay, I got to hit the B button here. You can see my typing skills. I can assure you this is not high. Okay. <laughs> well, I want to thank Gleaves and Mark for inviting me to this just outstanding symposium. Wow, I uh, was really impressed by the first uh, uh, panel and uh, my predece uh, predecessor. When I shared with my graduate uh, student seminar that I intended to come here and proclaim uh, at this conference that Dwight D. Eisenhower was the most religious president in the 20th century, they hooted back in unison, Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter, okay? Uh, soon thereafter, I read Philip Yancey's accounts of Billy Graham's ministry to Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s, and of Yancey's own religious conversations in the White House with Bill Clinton, and of course I thought of Woodrow Wilson, and I've been chastised by the reminder that American presidents have, in their own way, embodied a variety of religious experiences. And I've had to remind myself that we cannot reliably know the outward signs of 
inward grace, even among American presidents. Even so, Dwight D. Eisenhower would have ranked himself high among presidents of deep religious faith. In 1948, more than four years before becoming president of the United States, Eisenhower stated, quote, I am the most intensely religious man I know. I'm the most intensely religious man I know. Now, this extraordinary statement did not come from a zealous teenage catechumen, but was made by a mature 58-year-old adult who was then president of Columbia University. He was not naive about religious sentiment, nor unacquainted with intensely religious believers. As a hero of World War II, he had met inter international religious leaders. He knew of the religious faith of subordinates, such as his friend George Patton. He testified to the deep religious faith of his parents, especially his mother. He was the grandson of River, River Brethren uh, ministers who had uh, led his flock uh, from Pennsylvania to Kansas in the 19th century. And in Abilene, Eisenhower grew up in the house of his uncle, another River Brethren minister, and itinerant missionary. In other words, Eisenhower was well acquainted with religious fervor. Yet he still characterized himself as the most intensely religious man that he knew. Eisenhower's breathtaking religious self-assessment does not play large in traditional Eisenhower biography. Every biography, uh, the biographer acknowledges the importance of religion in Eisenhower's upbringing, but after Eisenhower left home for West Point, religious disappears as a major theme in his biography, and no one em emphasizes the influence of Eisenhower's deeply ingrained religious beliefs on his public life and work. Yet, if Eisenhower authentically perceived himself as a profoundly religious person, one would expect to encounter his religious values shaping the Eisenhower's administration's domestic and foreign policy. And it did, except that Midwestern habits of privacy and an intensely held conviction that religion was a personal matter often masked Eisenhower's most deeply held sentiments. Nonetheless, the outward signs of his religious faith were often dramatically evident. Eisenhower is the only American president to write his own inaugural prayer, for example. He's the only president to have been baptized in the White House. He was the first president to appoint a special assistant for religion, Pastor Frederick Fox. He faithfully presided over White House prayer breakfasts. He approved adding, in God we trust, to the United States currency and one nation under God to the Pledge of Allegiance. And it was the president, not as speech writers, it was the president who most frequently inserted religious references and themes into his public speeches. Soon after his election as president of the United States, in December 1952, Eisenhower addressed the Freedom Foundation. Our form of government has no sense, he said, unless it is grounded in a deep religious faith, and I don't care what it is. Not surprising, while Republican politicians, clergymen, and laity praised Eisenhower's piety, Democrats and liberal commentators grumped that Eisenhower's religious beliefs were bland and shallow. Ernst W. Lefevre, for example, defined Eisenhower as the personification of American popular piety and superficial religiosity. Quoting from William Lee Miller, Lefevre conceded that, quote, President Eisenhower, like many Americans, was a fervent believer in a very vague religion. The president was, in a word, quote, moral without being unpleasant. To the president's disadvantage, Lefevre compared Eisenhower's religious beliefs to those of Adlai Stevenson. 
the Democratic Party's presidential candidate in 1952 and 1956, Stevenson was a Unitarian, as was his mother, uh, who joined the Presbyterian Church, his father's, just prior to the 1956 election. According to Lefevre, membership in, a main, in the mainline Presbyterian Church was about all that Stevenson had in common with Eisenhower. Stevenson's religious heritage was more intellectual and sophisticated than Eisenhower's. Educated at Princeton and Harvard, Stevenson reportedly admired, quote, the breadth, perception, and social morality of Reinhold Niebuhr. Now, to his credit, Lefebvre did not claim that Stevenson had actually read The Nature and Destiny of Man or any other works by Niebuhr. Although Niebuhr had not directly influenced Stevenson's religious thought, Lefebvre argued that Niebuhr provided a lens through which to examine Stevenson's religious beliefs. If Eisenhower's religion was simple, vague, fervent, and crusading, Stevenson's beliefs, as illuminated by Niebuhr, were both more complex and more specific. Like Niebuhr, Stevenson pondered the irony of American history. While Stevenson acknowledged the sovereignty and transcendence of God, he also stressed the limits of human wisdom and power. Stevenson's God uh, prompted examination of human uh, finiteness and self-interest. The pervasiveness of evil in the world precluded quick or morally unambiguous solutions to social problems. Lefebvre inferred that Stevenson's Niburian view of man and history was coupled with an equally Niburian sense of responsibility for justice and peace. Now, predictably, in Lefebvre's uneven comparison of Stevenson's Niebuhr with, well, Eisenhower's Eisenhower, the supposed simplicity and naivete of the president's religious faith was accentuated. Rather than understood as textured and subtle, Eisenhower's thought was parodied as the antithesis of Stevenson's sensitive and ironic understanding of the human existential condition. At the White House, Special Assistant Frederick Fox, this is the religious guy, was infuriated by the Christian century's partisan mixture of politics and religion at the president's expense. In the 1950s political climate, however, it is not surprising that Lefebvre did not take Eisenhower's religious vocabulary seriously. Now, Eisenhower's civil religion rested on three suppositions well established by the time he graduated from West Point. First, that the dignity of individuals was warranted by God. Second, that, the, that American democracy was established on that faith. And thirdly, that each generation was called to fight its own crusade to defend against godless forces. In 1947, Eisenhower offered confession of his faith to the daughters of the American Revolution. Quote, individual freedom springs from unshakable conviction in the dignity of man, a belief, a religious belief, that through the possession of a soul he is endowed with certain rights that are his not by sufferance of others, but by reason of his very existence. Following his inauguration, Eisenhower met with the leaders of the National Council of Churches, where he compared his soldier's duty with a pastor's calling. This descendant of pacifist river brethren preachers acknowledged that his military profession might seem the antithesis of a clergyman's religious vocation. But even before he became president, Eisenhower believed that with very great vehemence, that military duty called him to an identical purpose of the ordained clergy. Both soldier and pastor were dedicated to the preservation of free government, which meant affirming the equality and dignity of man and, therefore, the glory of God. Eisenhower stated his civil faith simply. The United States was, quote, merely a translation in the political field 
of America's deeply held civil religion. Among the sacred texts of the American civil religion, he explained to the National Council of Churches with the Magna Carta, the American Declaration of Independence, and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man. Together, these historic documents had established the principle that government, government recognized the equality and dignity of man. But this premise, Eisenhower repeatedly stated and consistently stated, would be completely baseless without belief in a supreme being in front of whom we are all equal. Prayer was a central act of Eisenhower's relig civil religion. In contrast to formal liturgies, sacramental systems, worship customs, and conflicting doctrines, Eisenhower's view of prayer united all who believed in a supreme being. Although non-sectarian prayers often distressed doctrinaire believers, when couched in the rhetoric of civil religion, such prayers both galvanized political will and masked ideological and theological differences. It was prayer, Eisenhower believed, that most distinctly differentiated the communist system from the American way of life. It was religion rather than government, economics, or strategic interests that distinguished Americans from communists. Quote, more precisely than any other way, prayer places freedom and communism in opposition to one another. Eisenhower remarked at the 1953 lighting of the national Christmas tree, the communists found no purpose in prayer, Eisenhower observed, because Marxist materialism denied the existence of God, the very basis of America's belief in the dignity of man. The United States, on the other hand, drew hope and strength from prayer, Eisenhower believed, as religious faith is the foundation of free government, so prayer is an indispensable part of that faith. These religious settlements were not simply the president's pious meanderings. Eisenhower had given deep thought to the meaning and function of prayer and concluded that prayer was the central religious act of his personal faith and his, and his civil religion. He once confided to his White House secretary, Ann Whitman, that he did not conceive of God as any being, but as a source of affection otherwise absent from his life. Eisenhower's craving for affection was not for love provided by family or church. It was an affection that affirmed him as a child of God. Although he had abhorred the trappings of church as much as anyone, he said, he believed that religion uh, and, oh, excuse me, and believed that religion was a crutch for many, Eisenhower had no patience for atheists whom he characterized as persons who did not think. Democracy was founded on the religious presumption that all men are created equal. Quote, I know I am no better than lots of men, he confessed to Ann Whitman, but democracy worked because in the sight of God all persons were equal. Eisenhower's reliance on God's assurance of the equality and dignity of man was the transcendent affection which lay at the, course, at the core of Eisenhower's faith. Eisenhower's inaugural prayer faithfully, faithfully reflected his civil religion. His little private prayer as befitting public prayer was universalist in tone and in content. Predictably, he prayed for God's help teaching and strength. That is, Eisenhower prayed for the power of discernment so that, his, so that his administration might govern in the interests of all the people, regardless of station, race, or calling. And his authority? Eisenhower believed that the American Revolution had marked a great turning point in history when to establish a government for free men and a declaration and a constitution to make it last the founders had professed that, quote, we hold that all men are endowed by their creator, with creator by certain, with certain rights. But this one sentence confirmed, this one sentence confirmed that American government was embedded in a deeply felt religious faith. And to think otherwise, Eisenhower believed, made no sense. 
As William Pickett has shown, Eisenhower's decision to run for the presidency in 1952 was complex. Political mythology aside, a reluctant Eisenhower was not simply drafted by Republicans eager, eager to place the hero general on their ticket. And taking nothing away from the political nature of his decision to run, Eisenhower also experienced a religious-like religious transformation in this call to duty. Perhaps, of, as critics have suggested, this was Eisenhower's self-serving way of transcending sordid politics, which he so much detested. But Eisenhower also responded to a deeply felt sense of duty to America. As commanding general of the Allied forces in World War II and as supreme commander of NATO, Eisenhower had dedicated the better part of his life to securing world peace. He ran for president in 1952 to save the United States and the world from falling into a nuclear abyss. Paul Tillich defined religion as the object of our ultimate concern, usually centering on issues of being or non-being or death. Discern someone ultimate concern, Tillich argued, and you discover their religion. Eisenhower was not obsessed with the atomic bomb when he became president in 1953, but the former general had observed more than his share of human carnage on the World War II battlefields, in the Nazi death camps, and on the Korean Peninsula. Almost alone among United States military leaders during World War II, he'd opposed the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. Quote, it was not necessary to hit them with that awful thing, he later reflected. On a post-war low-level flight between Berlin and Moscow, Eisenhower was appalled that he saw no undamaged buildings and few things living from the Polish border to the Russian capital. Conditions in Germany differed in scale, but not in kind with those in the Soviet Union. Millions were dead or missing. Millions were homeless. Cities were in ashes and industry reduced to rubble. In aftermath, unimaginable destruction and incomprehensible inhumanity, Eisenhower experienced intensified stirrings of religious revival. Eisenhower's moral revulsion over the atomic bomb never lessened, but rather became a major force shaping his worldview, politics, and civil religion. Following his meeting with Secretary of War Stimson in Potsdam in 1945, when he first learned about the successful Trinity test, Eisenhower became depressed, not only because he did not believe the atomic bomb was needed to defeat Japan, but because he also did not believe the United States should be morally responsible for using a weapon of mass destruction needlessly to save American lives. He had hoped for post-war friendship with the Soviet Union, but the atomic bomb blasted away any chance for peace. Quote, I had hoped the bomb wouldn't figure in this war, he lamented. But the world had changed. I don't know now, he said. People are frightened and disturbed all over. Everyone feels insecure again. While the prospects of nuclear holocaust were depressing, Eisenhower was an incurable optimist. He possessed a religious-like faith that the worst circumstances could be turned towards good. And in this regard, he saw divine possibility even in the most demonic events. Whether it was the unspeakable horrors of World War II or the terrible portent of the atomic bomb, Eisenhower not only believed but virtually willed that these events would work toward the ultimate benefit of mankind. In October 1953, Eisenhower graphically described the deadly horrors of nuclear war to the United Church women. Although America had escaped the physical ravage of World War II, the United States its former security had disappeared with the threat of nuclear attack by intercontinental bombers. America had few choices, Eisenhower told the church women. The choice that spells terror and death is symbolized by a mushroom cloud floating upward from the release of the mightiest natural power yet uncovered by those who search the physical universe. The energy it typifies is, at this stage of human knowledge, the unharnessed blast. In its wake, we see only sudden and mass destruction, erasure of cities, the possible doom 
of every nation and society. But Eisenhower did not abandon hope that the titanic force of nuclear energy could be directed towards useful service of mankind. When Joseph Stalin died in March 1953, Eisenhower believed that the United States stood at a turning point in history, a time of unique danger, but a time of unique opportunity. Eisenhower's religious worldview was formed by a dialectical struggle between the divine and the demonic forces in history, an understanding not dissimilar to that of contemporary theologian Paul Tillich. Typically, Eisenhower had described his struggles against the dark forces of history and the rhetoric of the Crusades, which is what was his way of highlighting the epic nature of history. But Eisenhower was not unaware of the complexities of history. His universalist beliefs regarded the children, as the, uh, excuse me, regarded the Russians as the children of the same God who is the father of all peoples everywhere. And despite his transformation into a Cold War president, Eisenhower believed, as he had in 1945, that the Russian people generally longed for peace and friendship. In the spring of 1953, he saw a chance for peace. It is mystifying how scholars can read Eisenhower's chance for peace speech presented to the American Society for Newspaper Editors and still conclude that he was bland, vague, uninformed, and disinterested. The president's estimate of a chance for peace presented a manifestly political agenda while latently revealing Eisenhower's religious transformation. Eisenhower's vision of the middle way in human affairs reflected belief, excuse me, Eisenhower's vision of the middle way in human affairs rejected a belief in an, apo, in a, in a apocalyptic end to history. Eisenhower prefer, preferred to seek salvation within nature and human history and entertained no capitulation to evil or death in this world. Theologian Paul Tillich offered a more pacific version of this historic trinity in his Protestant interpretation of history in which the ages of autonomy, heteronomy, dialectically interacted, acting, were superseded by a theonomous age that is directed toward the divine principle in history revealed by the Kairos, the turning point in history that revealed the meaning and destiny of history. For Dwight Eisenhower, the spring of 1953 was just such a time of kairos, when the world was summoned to choose between peril and hope, between autonomy and heteronomy. A chance for peace described the kairos literally. Quote, this is one of those times in the affairs of nations when the gravest choices must be made, if there's to be a turning toward a just and lasting peace. It is a moment that calls upon governments of the world to speak their intentions with simplicity and honesty. It calls upon them to answer the question that stirs the hearts of all sane men. Is there no other way the world may live? What could the world hope for if there was no turning on this dreadful road, Eisenhower asked rhetorically. The worst was nuclear war. The best that could be hoped for was a life of perpetual fear and tension, wealth and labor dissipated in, endless, in an endless arms race, and governments discredited by the failure to achieve prosperity and happiness for mankind. The costs of the Cold War were staggering and debilitating. Quote, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who would who were hunger and not fed, who were cold and not clothed. And according to Eisenhower, the costs were not paid in cash alone. The Cold War consumed the daily work of laborers, the creativity of scientists, the future of children. And paraphrasing the 1908 presidential nominee, William Jennings Bryan, Eisenhower solemnly observed, quote, under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. Okay, and, I, and, I, and I'm just about there, all right? Eisenhower rejected despair. 
Although some of his prerequisites for peace included standard Cold War demands for a free Germany and free Eastern Europe that would not move to Soviet leaders, he also offered to explore modest incremental steps towards arms control and disarmament. Even these suggestions, including international control of atomic energy for peaceful purposes, were neither new nor original with Eisenhower, but they did rep represent confidence-building initiatives to lessen Cold War animosity if adopted. A Chance for Peace was one of Eisenhower's finest speeches. He was not free of co raw Cold War propaganda and his denunciation of Soviet tyranny. Eisenhower hated Stalin's heteronomy as intensely as he hated Hitler's. But in contrast to the Nazis with whom compromise was not possible, Eisenhower had hoped that the Kremlin leaders might be amenable to making small steps towards peace. Eisenhower was not naive about the difficulty of the path towards peace. Trust and goodwill would be difficult to establish with the Soviets in the Cold War atmosphere. If his arms control proposals were modest, it was because Eisenhower knew full well that the details of disarmament programs were necessarily critical and complex. Nightmares of the nuclear Armageddon haunted Eisenhower. As president pastor, he wanted both to educate and assure the American people while offering hope and leadership to the world. He might not be able to dismiss his ultimate concerns about nuclear death, but he could draw upon his faith that God intended humans to employ the atom for peaceful purposes. The chance for peace was a public prayer offering a middle way in public policy while reminding Americans of their historical destiny, instructing the public in the realities of the nuclear arms race and strengthening the world in its resolve to seek new, albeit risky, paths to peace. Characteristically, he tried to seize an historical opportunity rather than drift with the Cold War tide. A chance for peace outlined an agenda for nuclear arms control and disarmament from which Eisenhower and his administration would not deviate. Liberals bitterly criticized Eisenhower for not using the president's bully pulpit to denounce McCarthyism or to promote civil rights. Instead, Dwight D. Eisenhower dedicated himself politically, morally, and religiously to securing international peace in the nuclear age. May I compare Eisenhower's Tillich to Stevenson's Niebuhr at last? An exegetical president, Eisenhower w wrestled with the tension between divine and the demonic associated with managing a horrific but potentially beneficial nuclear technology. Eisenhower's vision was not prophetic. He preached no nuclear jeremiads, not even in his farewell military industrial complex speech. His role was exegetical, defining, explaining, and encouraging. And as we have seen, this intensely religious president interpreted the West's nuclear dilemma within the context of American civil religion and applied the precepts of the civil religion to his pursuit of nuclear peace. Okay, our next presentation will be by Thomas Carty, who I said before is the author of a new book on Kennedy and religion, which I highly commend to you. And appropriately, he is going to give a presentation entitled John F. Kennedy, Secular Icon or Catholic Hero. Thomas. Okay, well, I want to thank, <clears throat> I want to thank my panelists for their their patience in, in delivering these papers with, with the computer here for, uh, for my needs. And I wanted to start also by, um, I want to thank my, my, uh, my wife and my child who I left sick at home, but thankfully they're with my, my mother-in-law, so I, I have to thank her too. And uh, I want to thank also Mark and uh, Kathy Rent and all the people who've organized this, this panel, which couldn't be more appropriate considering the last election and the statistics that you've seen in fact, I, was, um, I told uh, someone driving to the airport that I was giving a, a talk on religion and the presidency, and he, and he proceeded to, 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 uh, to give me a lecture about the role of religion in this past, in this past election, and, and it seems like something that's on everybody's mind. And so what I'll try to do is to, to give you my thoughts about, about uh, John Kennedy and, and religion in, in his presidency. 
principally my, my remarks will be devoted to looking at how Kennedy was both a secular hero or a secular icon and a Catholic hero. And he was able to, um, to capture both of these, um, both of these, these uh, uh, images. And I'll tell you a brief anecdote. Uh, I, my headmaster in my high school was a non-sectarian high school, it was a private high school. He uh, loved two, he had two heroes, John Kennedy and Captain James T. Kirk from the Starship Enterprise. He was, a, he was a secular humanist, he was, a, he was an agnostic, he is an agnostic, and for, for him, Captain Kirk and John Kennedy were these symbols, were icons of the secular vision of the United States of America. On the other side, I also have the image of, of Kennedy as a Catholic hero. Um, my, my grandfather, um, James Murphy, sponsored John Kennedy's admission to the Knights of Columbus, which you know, the, perhaps you know the, the, the Catholic secret uh, society fraternity organization. Uh, so, so in one way, Kennedy is also the Catholic hero. And um, I should briefly mention that, um, that this is most of my work's been done on this, as, as Mark mentioned, um, uh, looking at John Kennedy running for the presidency and how religion effect affected him. And again, considering how significant this is, that the last, um, we've had, of course, there are 150 years in the United States, there were no Catholic president. There was no Catholic even running for president. And then in 1928, we have a Catholic running for president, Al Smith. He lost to Herbert Hoover in 1928, but it was only 32 years. Then we had another Catholic candidate, John F. Kennedy, and he wins. But now it'll be 48 years, considering if, if a Catholic is elected in 2008, um, half a century since we've had a Catholic um, elected to the presidency. And so it seems like there is a difficult balance for Catholics to, um, to not to appear overtly religious for fear of anti-Catholicism, and on the other side, to attract Catholic votes and to, and to prove themselves as good Catholics. So uh, I also want to thank my students. They told me to, to say hello when, when they heard that I would be on C-SPAN, and they, and they told me, they're very good marketers, they told me to hold up my book, which is, uh, <laughs> which is a Catholic in the White House, as, as Mark mentioned. So, Okay, so I'll, I'll review. Is Kennedy a secular icon? And I'll review some evidence for that based on uh, his pre-presidential years. On the other side, I'll, re I'll look at Kennedy as the, as the Catholic hero. As I said, Kennedy is, to many people, a, a secular icon, independent of institutions, independent of the Roman Catholic Church, making his decisions independent of, of major institutions or religious dogma. If you look at his education, he's educated at uh, Choate, uh, a non-sectarian high school in Wallingford, Connecticut, Princeton briefly, and then Harvard. Um, doesn't have a Catholic education. If you looked at his, his self-image or, or the images of Kennedy, you also see a, a secular view. Uh, in, 1940, in the late 1940s, I believe 1947, he said, there's an old saying in Boston, we get our religion from Rome and our politics at home. He clearly seemed to advocate a separation of church and state, religion from Rome, politics at home. And uh, there's a quotation from Jacqueline Kennedy quoted by uh, the journalist Arthur Crock, who said, when Kennedy ran for president in 1960, she said, I don't understand all this, all this, this uh, concern about Jack as a Catholic uh, running for president. He's not a very good Catholic. And, and she said, she, she reportedly said, now if it were Bobby Kennedy, now he goes to mass every day, but, but Jack, what's the concern? So he definitely had an ironic sense of religion, or not a devotional sense of, of religion. And if you look at Kennedy running for the um, presidency, he, you, would, you could say that he secularized, he privatized religion in the campaign. And uh, in 1959, he gave an interview to Look Magazine, which was the life magazine of the day. And he said, I wouldn't support aid to Catholic schools. I wouldn't support federal aid to Catholic schools. I wouldn't support the appointment of an ambassador to the Vatican, as, as Elizabeth mentioned, which Harry Truman had, had promoted. So he said, I'm, I'm not the Catholic candidate for president. I'm the Democratic candidate for president who happens to be Catholic. Again, separating himself from, from a, a devotional religion. The other famous, uh, in fact, this, this, this uh, prompted some, some response from Catholics. Uh, many Catholic publications criticized him. And one said, uh, the Indiana Catholic said, that young Kennedy better watch his mouth. 
in the way he's, he's, he's distancing himself from, from uh, Catholicism. Even some uh, Protestants uh, were thought that this was disturbingly secular. The other famous image is, is Kennedy before the Houston Ministerial uh, Association in, in September of 1960. Kennedy uh, was, in a, in a sense, he was on the stage alone. All the ministers were, were down below, almost in an inquisitional type uh, atmosphere, almost as if he were Galileo standing before the, uh, the, the questioners. And so he, he really promoted this image that he was independent, that he was secular and not, and not um, devoted or not in, in uh, necessarily a, uh, with strong allegiance, that he didn't have two allegiances to, to uh, church and state, but he had one allegiance to his office. In fact, uh, Kennedy on the, on the airplane ride to, um, to the Houston ministerial speech, he, he said, um, this is very concerning to him that he would have to speak about religion. He said, he said, it's very hard for a Harvard man like me to talk about questions of theology. And he said, probably my answers tonight will, uh, will give heartburn to those, uh, those people at Boston College and Fordham. They're probably going to give them heartburn, my answers about theology. And in fact, uh, recently, a, a Fordham University professor, Mark Massa, a, a Jesuit historian of religion, he, he said, yes, Kennedy did secularize the religion and privatize religion in a way that, um, in a way that was disturbing to him. Now, how was he able to do this then, to, to give this image of uh, secularism, but also to be a hero to Catholics? And the, the answer is that, that he was a victim of religious prejudice. And so he was, he was proponing, promoting an image that he was a Catholic defending, um, def defending Catholics against this religious prejudice. And so he was able to balance this. In fact, in his early political education, as a, as a Catholic uh, congressman from Massachusetts. He, um, he was called a, a white knight. He was called Galahad by the, by the um, Boston Pilot, the Catholic uh, publication in, in the Boston Archdiocese, for assisting federal aid to Catholic schools, for giving some assistance to Catholic schools. So early on, he did, he did um, perform as a hero to Catholics. He was um, a militant cold warrior, and this was Again, as, as Elizabeth discussed, the Catholic Church being militantly, uncompromisingly anti-communist because of the treatment of Catholics, uh, archbishops who were tortured and, and, and killed in, in Eastern Europe. The Catholic Church had a militant, uncompromising stand to communism, and Kennedy followed along with that. Um, he, in the late 1940s, he challenged Truman. He said, Truman's, Tru who lost China? He blamed Truman for losing China to communism in 1949. And he talked about people in the State Department just as Joseph McCarthy, the Wisconsin senator, also a Catholic, would do in the 1950s. And I think we can see the association of Kennedy and McCarthy because, of course, Joe Kennedy, John Kennedy's father, would, um, would socialize with Joseph McCarthy in the, in the Palm Beach mansion. Um, Robert Kennedy worked for, for McCarthy. In fact, uh, John Kennedy's two sisters, Jean and Pat, they, they even dated McCarthy. So that there, was a, there was a strong connection between Kennedy and that mil militant anti-communist wing of the, um, of, the, of the Catholic Church. And also in this, this image of Kennedy as a standard against prejudice, I think that's, that's the key in understanding Kennedy as the Catholic hero. Here was the, the tradition in the 1830s, there was this there's a fabricated story of Maria Monk, who was uh, a purported uh, nun from Canada, who talked about sexual liaisons between priests and, and uh, nuns in, in, in a monastery in, in Canada. And so this was all fabricated. This was proven to be untrue. But there was this sensationalist literature, sensationalist anti-Catholic literature, that Kennedy was, was still uh, living with the consequences of this anti-Catholicism. Even Uncle Tom's Cabin, we think of this as a great work of literature, but if you, if you read it carefully, the uh, St. Clair family is a Catholic family, the slave-holding family in, in, uh, in the book. And they're, they're the daughter, Ava St. Clair, she ta she's taken to a, a, a Methodist revival by Uncle Tom. And there's a clear message that the slaveocracy and the, and the Catholic hierarchy are sort of the two backward institutions that are, that are being swept away. Um, you could also see this in the late 19th century, the, the famous Thomas Nast cartoons, 
which really just revived the tradition that was there. Samuel F. B. Morse, better known for the, uh, f the as the originator of the telegraph, but also as uh, prolific anti-Catholic, uh, warned against the uh, papal colonization of of America through parochial schools, through Catholic schools, and through Catholic immigration from Ireland. So Kennedy was, was in a sense, a symbol of this, uh, this fear, this anti-Catholicism, and Kennedy was able to fight against this. And you also have the, um, the image of Al Smith, the 1928 presidential candidate, Al Smith. And here he is, he, uh, when, when there was a visit of the papal legate uh, in, in 1926, Smith actually kneeled and kissed the ring of the papal legate, and this was a symbol that Catholics couldn't have a, a singular loyalty to the United States, but they had a higher loyalty, or at least a dual loyalty, to America and to the Roman Catholic Church, the, the foreign Roman Catholic Church. So Kennedy was very much uh, fighting against this. In fact, um, in, in a private interview, Harry Truman said uh, in 1959, in an interview for um, Mr. Citizen, a biography they were writing about Truman, he said, I can't see a Catholic as president. They, they don't know how to separate church and state. So uh, Truman didn't say that publicly. And in fact, he would be uh, calling Richard Nixon a bigot in September 1960. So it was, it was clear that his loyalties were more political in this than, than commitment to this prejudice. But this did exist. So in the 1960 campaign, uh, tr uh, Ka Kennedy was able to, was able to um, in the words of Thomas Mayer, the Kennedys, in a sense, are the ultimate Irish Catholic family. A recent book by Thomas Mayer calls Kennedy the, the, uh, Kennedy's the ultimate Irish Catholic family. So which is it? Is it, is it Mark Masson's version, Kennedy is the, the secularist who privatized religion? Or is it, or is it Kennedy's as the ultimate um, Irish Catholic family? I think Kennedy is able to balance it nicely because in, in, um, in 1960, Kennedy is able to, as you can see in the southern states, he didn't lose too many southern states, the, the green states, because they were strongly democratic. Even if there was some anti-Catholic prejudice, the, uh, the, 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 the strong democratic loyalty of the, of the south allowed Kennedy to win five southern states. And you also notice that if he did lose some southern states, if he did lose 10 electoral votes in Florida or 11 electoral votes in Tennessee, he more than made that up with the, with the strong Catholic vote of, of New York City and New York's 45 electoral votes. And Pennsylvania, the strong Catholic state of, of uh, 32 electoral votes. So in a sense, Kennedy was able to um, manage this issue such that he could still be an icon to secularists, but yet a hero to Catholics as the, the Galahad standing alone against the anti-Catholicism and uh, fighting against the anti-Catholic prejudice. However, um, so when Kennedy becomes president, is he still able to do this? If you look at Kennedy's presidential record, could Kennedy please both secular icons and Catholic, and, uh, Catholic Americans? Robert Frost sort of warned him. He, um, the poet Robert Frost was invited to the inauguration, and in his inauguration um, poem, uh, Robert Frost said that Kennedy should be more be more Irish than Harvard. He warned Kennedy to be more Irish than Harvard. And yet, with Kennedy's nominations for president, he was clearly bending over backwards to avoid any, any appearance of favoritism towards, towards Catholicism. There's, a, um, there's an organization called, the, the, today it's called Americans United. In this day, it was called Protestants and Other Americans United for Separation of Church and State. And they were strongly suspicious of a Catholic president and this is the um, this is the cartoon that they that they put in their December 1960 issue, and you, as you can see, they were very fearful that here was a Catholic president, but would he now practice policies of church censorship? Would he now promote um, opposition to artificial birth control, aid to parochial schools, public aid for Catholic colleges? And you can see on the top it says the president's appointment list as if these were the people lined up for appointments with, uh, with, with the new Catholic President Kennedy. It also might be referring to the appointments. Who, who would Kennedy appoint um, to his cabinet, to other offices? Would he appoint all Catholics? And so he was very careful. In fact, um, Sergeant Shriver, his brother-in-law, who um, organized the, uh, the, the, the appointments for the Kennedy administration, he uh, 
they were looking at Robert McNamara, who, was the sec who would be the Secretary of Defense. And uh, the, the, the corporate executive was a Republican chosen to, to sort of pacify the, the divisions of Republicans and Democrats during the campaign. And they said, uh, Sergeant Shriver said, gee, McNamara, is that an Irish name? Is, is he Catholic? And they actually took out who's who. And they were flipping through who's who to see, gee, is, is he Catholic? Because this could be problematic if we're nominating a Catholic as Secretary of Defense. So as you can see, Kennedy really bent over backwards as, as um, president to um, be cautious. And I'll look at two issues briefly here, the aid to education and then um, foreign policy. Um, when we look at the bill, federal aid to education, the first major piece of legislation in uh, 1961 that Kennedy would, inter would introduce. And uh, it, it's, it's re really look, looking at the autopsy of this bill because it just, it just died in, in committee. Kennedy didn't, didn't back it, he didn't support um, aid to education. Well, he did support aid to education, but he didn't support aid to Catholic schools. And so it died in committee because a, a, a New York, a Catholic congressman from New York, he voted against it. He said it's all or nothing. You know, we either have aid to Catholic schools and public schools or no aid. And he, this Democrat, Catholic congressman from New York, joined with the Republicans who were opposed to all aid to education and they killed the bill. Also during the Kennedy administration, no aid to federal education and um, to Catholic or, pri or, or public schools, but also the uh, Supreme Court ruled that there would be no, pa no prayer in public schools. And it's very interesting, Kennedy's response. Kennedy um, didn't, even though public opinion was against the Supreme Court decision, Kennedy didn't try to rally some support. He, uh, he maintained a secular stance and he eventually said, it's better that, that we pray in their homes. And he tried to encourage private, privatization of religion. But he didn't um, try to rally against this. So what was the Catholic response to this? Um, very interesting. That America Magazine, a Jesuit publication, just at the end of the football season in, in January 1962, they ran a headline, Harvard Six, Irish Six, as if to say that this Kennedy really hasn't shown himself to be Irish or shown himself to, to be advocating especially for Catholic issues, but he seems to be playing this uh, balance between the Catholic and the secular. Um, Cardinal Spellman and other Catholics were very frustrated with this and, and they thought there was a, there was a growing secularism. Um, but Kennedy seemed to be very comfortable with this. He even joked, he even quipped about, about these, the, the, the defeat of the AT education bill. He said, he said, I, I talked to the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice, about uh, the AT education bill, and he said, yes, it was constitutional. It hasn't got a prayer, <laughs> which was double entendre, saying that, that, no, there was no religion in this bill, but it also would, wouldn't survive. The um, Kennedy referred to, uh, in the days of Al Smith, there was a fear of dual loyalty, that Al Smith would, um, would bring the Pope into the White House if he were to become president in 1928. And there was a joke that went in Protestant circles that said, a tel he sent a one-word telegram, Smith sent a one-word telegram to the Pope. He said, unpack, you're not coming. Kennedy said, when I, when the, when, when I didn't uh, support aid to Catholic education, the Pope sent me a one-word telegram. And he said, pack. So Kennedy didn't seem to be very concerned about the, about the Catholic um, the distancing himself from, from Catholicism um, and secularizing the presidency. How about in international relations? Um, we can look at the, the, the image that Kennedy gets of, of, of being opposed to, um, to institutions, being opposed to a, a militarism, um, being opposed to a, a dogmatic anti-communism. In the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy chooses uh, diplomacy. It seems to be that he really resisted pressures to, to use force. He chooses diplomacy. And, um, this, this, wouldn't, this wasn't the thought that most non-Catholics had. They thought it, this would be a new holy war with a Catholic president, a holy war against communism. But Kennedy didn't uh, pursue that. So you would wonder about this. You would say, well, um, this is Kennedy, did he, have, did he have a strong influence of religion? And he said, um, they asked him about this. They, they said, uh, it, it, there was a papal encyclical. It's called Peace on Earth. And uh, Pope John XXIII, issued this papal encyclical advocating diplomacy and, and United Nations involvement in, uh, in, the, in the Cold War and in international relations. And Kennedy said, as a, as, a, as, an, as a Catholic, I'm very proud of this. As an American, I've learned from it. 
he seemed to, to accept the idea that, that there could be a link between uh, religion and, and Catholicism as well as uh, a secular view. And yet he's, he also, also distanced himself from an explicitly religious view of this. He said, um, he said that uh, this, this statement by the Pope, it closely matches other statements that have been made by Protestants and, and even people that have no religious faith. And so again, he, he chose, given a choice between giving an overtly Catholic message and a secular message, he, he chose the Catholic message. One final comment on this, uh, this, this uh, speech at American University that Kennedy gave in 1963, often cited as evidence that Kennedy would retreat uh, from Vietnam and would, 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 uh, would back off in the Cold War and there would be a detente between the United States and the Soviet Union. And um, as, as I, there's a quotation I'd like to read to you, and a, as I read it, consider um, Ronald Reagan's 1983 speech, the famous evil empire speech, and what he calls the Soviet Union an evil empire. In 1963, Kennedy said, 20 years earlier, you might even hear this as a rebuttal to Ronald Reagan, he says, um, no government or social system is so evil that its people must be considered lacking in virtue. And so he didn't, uh, he didn't support the, the idea that, that uh, Ronald Reagan promoted of, of trying to um, express a, a religious, uh, the Cold War in religious terms, even as you heard Eisenhower looking at the Cold War in religious terms. He saw it as a secular issue, an issue of, of diplomacy. Okay, so in conclusion, what, what's our assessment of, of Kennedy as a, is he a secular icon? Is he a, is he a a Catholic hero? Kennedy certainly impressed secularists. He certainly impressed secularists by his independence of the Roman Catholic Church, his independence of Catholic traditions and dogma. How about Catholics, though? Liberal Catholics certainly supported Kennedy. They saw Kennedy as a step along with uh, Pope John XXIII of a modernization in the church a modernization of Catholics, assimilation into American culture. However, traditionalist Catholics, traditionalist Catholics felt betrayed by Kennedy. And you could see this in Cardinal Spellman, the New York Archbishop. Um, you could see this in the comments of uh, America Magazine, saying Kennedy is not really favoring uh, religion. Traditionalist Catholics had come, later on would come to favor uh, Ronald Reagan, who appointed ambassador to the Vatican, George W. Bush in this recent election, um, who has supported faith-based initiatives, who uh, hired a Catholic, uh, Mother Teresa's lawyer, to, to head the office of, of faith-based initiatives. So it's, it's uh, I think Kennedy was very much able to balance the two, secular icon and Catholic hero, but he didn't really place, he didn't really uh, create a model for other Catholic politicians on how to do this. And in fact, he may have, by, by being so secular in his presidency, he may have promoted or furthered the image that Catholics appeared more as uh, political opportunists, denying their religion. Uh, religion has a role or a place in public life. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes the presentations on this panel, and I think as moderator I have the discretion maybe to uh, change our schedule just a little bit and open it up to questions from the audience, and then if there's some time left at the end, if the panelists want to question each other, we'll do that. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. I'll recognize you, and um, our panelists will be happy to answer your questions. Yes, please. Yeah, Professor Paul, thank you very much for your, for your remarks on Eisenhower. And yes, thank you. I, I was fascinated by your analysis of Eisenhower's religion at the uh, Potsdam Conference. If, if I heard you correctly, he was opposed to dropping the atom bomb <coughs> because for multiple reasons, but among them, the reason that it would be immoral. Right. It'd be immoral to use that kind of weapon. And yet, as president then, how do you, how do you explain the way in which he gave in if he was, maybe he wasn't giving in to John Foster Dulles and brinkmanship. In other words, the continuous threatening with nuclear weapons, if it's immoral to use it, wouldn't it also be immoral to threaten to use it? 
Or was that Dulles more than Ike? And was Dulles given more of a free hand? And he was a Presbyterian elder. Well, this is a very complex question. And uh, the answer is, uh, is I'm, I'm afraid, going to be complex and perhaps not too satisfactory. Eisenhower's decision or his recommendation not to use the atomic bomb as immoral in 1945 was, I think, situational. It had to do with the fact that his belief that the Japanese were already defeated and that to use the bomb in that case, and of course there's a lot of people who wouldn't agree with him, including Harry Truman, that the use of the bomb was, was not uh, tactically, it wasn't strategically needed and wasn't tactically useful, that uh, our firebombing of Tokyo and other Japanese cities was wreaking far more havoc uh, than even the atomic bombs, as horrible as they were. And I just don't think he, you know, he didn't think it was needed, but more than that, he saw that the use of the atomic bomb was going to severely uh, hurt perhaps wreck ch chances for post-war post peace. And as his son John uh, reports, he was very depressed after Potsdam. As I quoted here, he said, you know, here we, ha we had hopes and dreams, and now they're dashed by this, by this nuclear weapon. <coughs> However, at, immediately after the war, uh, Bernard Brody sent him a, a copy of his uh, of his essay on uh, the absolute weapon, which is in the Eisenhower Library with marginalia in Eisenhower's hand. Initially, Eisenhower didn't see atomic weapons as being uh, exponentially different from the mass use of ordinary HE. And uh, that did, did not change his opinion until after the advent of Castle Bravo and the thermonuclear weapon. You hear Eisenhower talking about massive retaliation before Castle Bravo. So far as I know, Eisenhower never used the term massive retaliation after Castle Bravo in 1954, although the Democrats picked up on the mantra of massive retaliation and used it repeatedly uh, as an embarrassment to the Eisenhower administration. Now I can just, I'm, I'm going I'm to conclude my comments here. Obviously, we've got a lot more we can talk about if you'd like to uh, pursue this part of the conversation. Yeah, the nice thing about this two days conference is we have many opportunities for these interactions to develop after we've had these formal panels. Other, other questions from the audience or would any other of the other panelists like to address that question in particular? I'll just say Elizabeth a, Spalding, please. A, a word on that. Um, I was struck that uh, Truman uh, at Potsdam going back and forth, he described in his longhand notes, he didn't keep a daily diary, but he kept these uh, sporadic longhand notes that are quite detailed. He also described the devastation uh, that he was seeing in much the way that Eisenhower did. Um, when he was asked about, uh, faced with the decision of whether to drop atomic bombs, um, he knew that the atomic weapon was something new, but he also had been, it had been explained to him that uh, it wasn't, um, as you said, that uh, it would be um, not any exponentially new. Uh, you could go ahead and, and keep doing firebombing, or you could drop these two bombs. And, and in his mind, it was more clear, it was more decisive. It would have more of an effect on the Japanese. It would break them, and it would save the lives of so many American GIs who had been uh, dying in the Pacific. So uh, when it came to the hydrogen bomb, um, by that point, you know, you're up to the early 1950s, you've had a whole period of atomic espionage. Uh, now Truman knew uh, what the Soviets knew and what they were pursuing and that they already had their own atomic um, bomb in 1949. And so uh, that was a very quick decision for him where he said, uh, can the Soviets do this? Are they trying to get the hydrogen bomb? And his advisor said yes, and he said, well, then we have to proceed with development of it. So more practical, still... Um, some ethical concerns, but very much in the context of the Cold War. Okay. By the way, let Thank me yeah. interject one yeah, thing quickly. here that is on, the to is on the topic. After Stalin died, uh, there was a lot of dancing, of course, through the halls of the White House and the executive office building and all. And in the midst of all of this, Dwight Eisenhower said to his staff and the NSC and the State Department, yes, but you've got to remember that the Russians are also the children of God. 
Now, personally, I just, I just found this an extraordinary statement. I don't know of any other president of the United States who would ever have said that, let alone think it. Maybe, maybe there are others, but uh, that gives you a, an idea of Eisenhower's world view. Yes, but you've got to remember the Russians are also the children of God, says Eisenhower to his uh, official family. Truman, tr just, to, just to add on this, in the 40s, Truman wrote um, at length about um, how horrible it was that peoples were enslaved and what tyrants were doing to them. And he had sympathy, great sympathy, for those behind the Iron Curtain. So I don't know if, I don't recall the exact expression, children of God, but he constantly used the image of everybody being equal in the eyes of God. Uh, and that wasn't just Americans, that was around the world. So he had the same sort of concern for those that he called enslaved by, by Soviet tyranny. Okay, thank you. Yes, other questions from the audience, please? We have a question here, and also the microphone helps if yeah, we can hear the questions a little bit better that way. Um, I was just going to ask, this panel in comparison to the early panel, I find a, a marked difference between um, the professors talking about providence as being uh, central to the discussion of, uh, of foreign policy, of, um, of preserving American dem democracy. I'm hearing a lot more in this panel um, about faith um, being integral to the president's workings. I, I was wondering if you noticed um, a difference, a shift in the rhetoric and the religious rhetoric of the president's, whether or not it was, you know, toned down this issue of providence in a more modern era or if you felt like these presidents very much continued to see providence as involved in, um, in what the, these presidents uh, did in foreign policy and domestic policy. I, I think that's an excellent question. And I tell you, one of the things I'm doing when I leave here is go right back to the Eisenhower Library. I don't recall Eisenhower using the word providence or, prov or, 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 or that lingo. Uh, obviously, I, one of the things I hope you picked up on from, from, from my talk is that in many ways Eisenhower's view of civil religion was deeply rooted in the 18th century and in many ways wasn't much different from George Washington's or Jefferson's or Madison's. And I'm struck and I'm really glad to hear what these uh, previous scholars said because Eisenhower, probably because of his West Point education, was very, very much in touch with that tradition. But one of the things Eisenhower never did when he prayed, remember I, I said that Eisenhower prayed for strength and wisdom and thanksgiving. He never prayed for victory. He never, he, 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 he never, he never prayed, uh, before, uh, the example, before, in Normandy, he never prayed for the triumph of American troops. I don't know that Eisenhower believed that God was Lord of history. I've, I've got to go back now and really uh, look at this very carefully. Uh, one of the things, he tells a story about when he was a, when he was a youth, and I didn't have time to get that in. Uh, he got blood poisoning and, uh, and uh, came close to death. And the story about how his brother uh, watched over him, and the doctor thought they were going to have to amputate the leg, and Eisenhower pled with the doctor, don't, don't amputate my leg. And, and so other biographers tell about the Eisenhower family gathering around and praying and praying, which they did. The thing that Eisenhower was very sensitive about and said every chance he got, look, we weren't, they weren't praying for God to intervene, he said. They weren't praying. My folks weren't faith healers. We don't believe that God intervenes in history in, in, a, in a direct way. So I don't know that Ike believed in, in providence in the way that, uh, that Lincoln believed in providence.